Thank you, Patrick. Thank you, Pastor Freddie. Three guys were walking down the road. They were walking right down the middle of the road. They thought they were pretty big stuff. The first guy, he, on the right-hand side, as he's going down the road, the first guy, he was uh, quite a wise guy. He had spent a lot of time in Scripture. All three were Christians. And the first guy, he was, he was pretty smart in the Scriptures. And he, he was rattling off the Scriptures like some people might, uh, like popcorn popping out of a pan. And he's, he's got it all figured out. He's a pretty, pretty wise guy. And the next guy in the middle, he's quite a strong fella, and he'd been on uh, American Ninja Warriors a few times, and he thought he was quite the stuff, and he could bench press, uh, you know, co quite a bit, twice his weight, and he was bragging about all the things that he could do physically. And then the third guy on the, right, on, the, on, the, on the side, walking down the road, he says, well, that's nothing. He says, I got $7 million in the bank, and I got enough stocks and bonds to last me for the rest of my life and give to my kids, and he had invested his money wisely, and he, you know, and he was bragging about all the things that he did. Well, then there's a guy just kind of walking in the back behind him, the fourth guy. I didn't mention that guy. And the fourth guy, old Billy back there, he, he wasn't very strong. He was kind of like that kid's book. What is that kid's book? Uh, uh, there's a... Yeah, that guy. It was the Diary of the Wimpy Kid behind there. And he wasn't strong. He wasn't very wise. And he, he sure didn't have more than about 42 cents in his pocket. <coughs> Anyways, they said, well, what about you there, Billy? What do you got to talk about? He says, well, he says, you know, I really don't know a lot about wisdom. I don't, I'm not a very strong guy. And I really don't have very much money. But you know, as a Christian, the one thing I pray about, because I don't know wisdom and all the things like you do, is, he says, I'm like the guy in Proverbs chapter 30, where I pray two things. And he says, well, what's that, Billy? He says, well, I pray to God every day. I say, like the man in Proverbs 30, Oh, God, don't make me so rich that I would forget you. And don't make me so poor that I would beg and, Don't make me so poor that I would beg and steal. And I tell God, give me the portion that is mine. And the three guys in the front, they, uh, they didn't have much to say after that. Which brings me to our sheet that you have in front of us. If you would open up uh, your sheet that has the three pages on it. And uh, turn to the back page, the last page there. And something I was going through in, uh, in, in the book of Jeremiah, I just happened to be, you know, how you, you know how you pick up sometimes a book and you just start reading it somewhere? You open up the Bible and you start paging through things. And I started reading in, in Jeremiah. And I think I was reading start, starting about chapter 4, and I just started reading it. And I finally got to John, uh, Jeremiah chapter 9, and it really, it really caught my attention. I've read this before, and I even memorized or worked on memorizing this, this verse years ago. And it really talks about those three guys walking down the street, doesn't it? It says in Jeremiah 9, 23 and 24, Thus says the Lord, Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man glory in his might. Nor let the rich man glory in his riches. But let him who glories glory in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord, exercising loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth, for in these I delight. So here we have the, our four characters. One is with the perspective that we have here. Let not a mighty man boast or glory in his wisdom, or let not a wise man glory in his wisdom. And I'm saying this at the, at the onset here, because in the middle of pursuing Proverbs, and in the middle of looking at the book of Proverbs, one could get over time the wrong perspective and they could start thinking that they should um, did you guys get a piece of paper oh you did good thank you um, thank you Karine wherever she is but from the onset a person could start to look at the book of Proverbs and they begin to think that maybe they're getting over a period of time such an education in wisdom and the fear of the Lord and the things like that that they could begin to get a little bit 
you know, arrogant about what they know. Even to the point where even Paul the Apostle brings about that same concept in the New Testament where he says, um, um, knowledge, in the, Greek it's, in the Greek it has the flavor of knowledge tends to puff up, but love edifies. And the whole idea that ultimately, as we go through the book of Proverbs, as we learn the word of God, we want to be kind of bringing ourselves back to this point right here. Let not a wise man glory in his wisdom, or a mighty man in his might, or a rich man in his riches, but let him who glories, glories in this, that he knows me, and that I am the God who exercises righteousness, judgment, and, and, and loving kindness on the earth, thus says the Lord. And I just wanted to bring us all back to that, just whether it be doctrinal truth or proverbial truth, or our heart that is fixed on old uh, Billy back here who just is concentrating on his walk with the Lord, his love for the Lord, and just being a simple man who just uh, glories in who this wonderful God is that, uh, that he trusts in. So with that being said, let's uh, um, go to your first page that you have there. And what I'm trying to do today is I'm just trying to, uh, um, Morris I think would probably relate to this a little bit more, I think uh, kind of a flow chart kind of thing and electronic circuits and things like that because uh, Morris did a lot of that and I'm not, I'm not an electronics guy but I, I uh, had, had a roommate one time before I got married that uh, he, was electronic, uh, he was an electronic engineer and he had all these diagrams and schematics all laid out sometimes on the, like the dining room table and I'm looking at those and he's got all these uh, signals or symbols for resistors and all the various things and I'm looking at that, what's that, what's this, and that's a closed circuit, that's an open circuit, whatever. So sometimes you see through the years, you know, a person asks themselves a question and they say, okay, uh, maybe I'm being a little bit funny here, but sometimes when you see the the shows on TV, door number one, door number two, and door number three. That's kind of what I have laid out here. If you look at the A, B, and C there, I have kind of like, you know, door number A, door number B, and door number C. And I've got three items here, but the main thing is, uh, I'm just going to say this from memory, and you can just listen here, but in the beginning of the book of Proverbs, it talks about the benefits of the book of Proverbs. And after it explains the benefits, then it gives sort of the qualifying statement as to what kind of heart a person would be wise to have if they are going to begin to enter into this proverbial wisdom. And then a statement that relates to father and mother and a person listening to them. And then with that same flavor of that, Solomon makes a comment and he says, my son, if sinners entice you, do not consent. And gives the consequences of a person who does consent to that and the next section for the last part of chapter 1 is Lady Wisdom personified, cries out. And basically the father is saying, if sinners entice you, do not consent. But if Lady Wisdom entices you, to use that expression, then consent to her. So if you look at this chart right here, I'm just trying to... You know how you pick up, you know how you pick up a brochure sometimes? You pick up a brochure for, you know, uh, some vacation. You pick up a brochure about something that is... Of, of interest to you and what do you usually see in the brochure? You see a lot of good color pictures and a lot of things and you open up the pages and it talks about all the benefits, right? And then one of the things you look at first after that is how much is it what? <laughs> how much is it going to cost? And what's in it for me for as far as how much, how much sweat equity do I have to put into this? How much do I have to do that? So if you look in the bottom of your sheet and I apologize that I've got it a little bit smaller for some of us, uh, you know, aged types here that don't see quite as good, but uh, I haven't quite figured out uh, the bigger item here for as far as getting on a bigger sheet just at the moment here this morning. But you look on the bottom of the sheet there, and this is in that first part of Proverbs, the benefits of Proverbs. And on the bottom part there, on the very bottom in the middle, it says big promises or benefits, and I say that three times across the top. Big promises or benefits, big promises or benefits to. So on the left hand side, big promises or benefits to know, to perceive, to receive. In the middle, big promises or benefits to the simple man, to the young man, or big promises and benefits to the hearing wise man or to the hearing man of understanding. This is what I call, as I put on the bottom there, the brochure. And if you look on the 
right of that box, everybody likes the brochure before the ground rules are laid out, before the fee is announced, so to speak. So listen to this brochure right now. Here's the brochure verbally from the book of Proverbs. I've said this before, but I just wanted to introduce it this way. Solomon says in his introduction in chapters 1, verses 1 through 6, he says this. The Proverbs of Solomon. The son of David, king of Israel, to know wisdom and instruction, to perceive the words of understanding, to receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, judgment, and equity, to give prudence to the simple, to give to the young man knowledge and discretion. A wise man will hear and increase learning, and a man of understanding will attain wise counsel. To understand a proverb and an enigma, the words of the wise and their riddles. What a great brochure. The introduction into the book of Proverbs, to know something, to receive something, to perceive something, the words of understanding. Two categories of people, to the young man, to the simple man, or the simple person would be like the naive person who doesn't basically know anything about anything biblically, so to speak. And then at the end of it, a wise man will hear, hear these Proverbs, and increased learning, and a man of understanding will attain wise counsel to understand four things, a proverb, an enigma, the words of the wise, and their riddles. So here it's like, wow, this is great. That's like the brochure. But then the very next verse after that is like the ground rules. And if you, and if you just look up from the bottom there, where I have where it says the word content, the content, the contents of wisdom is not yet stated in the opening verses. And what I mean by the contents of wisdom is like it just names off what you're going to get but it doesn't say you know in what categories it might say you know righteousness justice equity and every good path or later on but it might say in the beginning to know to know you know to perceive the words of understanding to receive the instruction of wisdom justice judgment and equity it just sort of names off a category but it doesn't give basically the contents of what that is so the contents of wisdom is not yet stated in the opening verses in that of Proverbs, but as John the Baptist prepared the way of the Lord, so the fear of the Lord prepares the way for all that follows in the book of Proverbs. So here that verse is just simply right above there as you look on your sheet, starting from the bottom going up about two inches. On the right hand side in the green it says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. On the left hand side, fools despise wisdom and instruction. And the reason I put them on that right side and left side is basically when you're looking at my three doors right here basically the right hand side of the paper is going to be basically the fear of the Lord side and more toward the left hand side is going to be the uh, what I would call and I have listed here on the very top as you look at your paper here on the on the, on the top left upper upper left hand corner I, I rather than calling it you know like like Mr. T member and uh, remember Mr. T years ago what was that show a team, yeah. He'd always he say, "You fool, you fool." He'd, he'd, I'm not using the term "fool" in that sense. I'm using sure. Sure, it says in Scripture, "The fool says there is no God." I realize that, but I'm using the biblical fool in the sense of quote unquote the biblical fool as one who is not in the Old Testament context. In, in at least as we're talking about the Book of Proverbs, Deuteronomy six. It says, when you, as parents, rise up, when you sit down, when you walk by the way, you shall teach these things to your sons. And specifically, it was the Mosaic Law and the Ten Commandments, along with the other 603 laws that were associated with that. And it was a whole culture of not only, as it says in Psalms 34, I think it was David, he says, let me teach you the fear of the Lord. And in that Old Testament culture, they were teaching the children the concept of the fear of the Lord, the reverence of the Lord, and inculcated in that was all these festivals that related to the Lord and inculcated into this whole lifestyle of the, of the Israelite people was <coughs> these wonderful things that God has done to deliver Israel out of Egypt after being there for 400 years, all the plagues that were put upon Egypt, all the things that God did to deliver Moses out and the Red Sea going on top of all the Israelite, er, going on top of all of Pharaoh's army. And like Psalm 111 says, God has made his wonderful works to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion. So here we have the Israelites in this culture 
knowing the fear of the Lord, and it's in this context that the book of Proverbs really just thrives. What I have here in the next, as you go up toward the, toward the top, on the one side, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. The beginning of knowledge. The fear or reverence of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. And let's just say that to be fair to how life is, isn't it true that, that we have on the one side, we have a person who might fear the Lord and a person who doesn't fear the Lord, but they despise wisdom and instruction. And to be fair, there are people that are somehow somewhere in the middle. They've got one foot in the fear of the Lord and one foot into things they shouldn't be in, and they're sort of going back and forth. And I'm not denying that that's also part of it. But when you look at now, you go up in the section where it says B right there. And just below that section B, I have the question. Ask the above question of yourself. And the question is, do you have the fear or the respect or reverence of the Lord, Proverbs 1.7. And if it says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction, you can ask that question. And that's why my son, he said it's, uh, it's not a diagram for uh, 87 uh, Buick or whatever he said there. But in a sense, it's like a flow chart to ask some questions that relate to the very flow of the context in Proverbs chapter 1. So asking yourself the question in the B section right there, do you have the fear of the Lord? And if you look to the left of that, if you answer yourself the word, you know, if you answer no, I don't, and let's just to say for conversation purposes, you're a young person who's never even dabbled in the scripture, your parents haven't taught you anything from Proverbs, for example, and you say no. Well then over in the A section over there, and that A section relates to Proverbs 1 verses 8 and 9. Now listen to this, this is the very verse after 1, Proverbs 1, 6. And uh, 6 and 7, but Proverbs 1, 8 and 9, it says, Hear, my son, the instruction of a father, and do not forsake the law of your mother. For they, in other words, the instruction of a father and the, you know, the law of a mother, whatever, for they will become an ornament on your head and chains about your neck. And here, in that whole context right here in A, you learn from your parents the fear of the Lord. Old Testament, Deuteronomy 6, like I just mentioned, Proverbs 1, 8 and 9. Hear, my son, the instruction of a father, and do not forsake the law of your mother. And if a person as who had just said, do you have the fear of the Lord, and the person, let's say, to a, to a degree that they would understand that, they would say, no, I really don't, or I have a very little understanding of it. So you go to the left after you say no and say, well, the proverb says right there, hear, my son, the instruction of a father. So, oh, okay, I can respond to that. So then you listen as you go upwards in the A, hear your father's instruction, 1, 8, and 9, do not forsake the law of your mother. And then you have in that context coming out of one, if, if you have your Bibles, turn, turn there at the moment to just Proverbs, turn, to turn to 1, 1, 8, and 9, uh, just so you can kind of uh, uh, look at it rather than... But you look at one, 1 through 6, and there is like the brochure, the introduction to Proverbs. Number, verse 1, 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. Right there in verses 8 and 9, my son, hear the instruction of your father. Do not forsake the law of your mother. And then once you get that settled as to a father and mother at least being in the realm of being ones who can teach the fear of the Lord, here Solomon says to his son, my son, if sinners entice you, do not consent. And just that word alone, my son, if sinners entice you, do not consent. And for all practical purposes, it would sum up the rest of the book of Proverbs. Because throughout the entire rest of the book of Proverbs, you're going to have people, sinners who would entice you. And even though there's Proverbs that relate to, uh, you know, uh, things from a positive point of view, whenever you have Proverbs that have like a, a positive side that relate to righteousness and a negative side of that same proverb that relates to unrighteousness, Basically, if sinners entice you, do not consent. And if a person is listening to their father and their mother, and if you look above my A section right there, uh, where I have the word yes with an exclamation mark, you see that? And if a person is going to respond to their parents and say yes, in other words, come out of that with the fear of the Lord, then if, you, if you're looking at my chart right here, if you look at this and, the, and you respond to the fear of the Lord, 
and you say yes to that as a parent teaching you, well then if you go across the top over to the right, well then the fear of the Lord, you advance to the beginning of the stage of knowledge or you, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. But if you look at my section A there and if you look at the bottom of A where it says learn from the parents the fear of the Lord, a person might not respond. So they might just say no. Or even after their parents teach them at the top of the box of A there, they might say no. And both of those no's lead back down to the furthermost left-hand corner there in the middle of the sheet. It says, you have stepped into the beginning of the non-fear of the Lord route, as I put it, or the route of the fool who despises wisdom and instruction. And, and if you look right there on the top left-hand corner where it says the biblical fool route, I just call it unknowledge because if, if the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, the non-fear of the Lord is the beginning of unknowledge, as I might put it, or foolishness for as far as the biblical proverbial record is concerned. So anyways, you know, in all fairness to the text, I'm trying to bring a reminder here for all of us in light of the, the illustration I had at first, where there would be this attitude that we might have that this, like my son said when he was saying, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding in all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your paths smooth or he will direct your steps. If the person has a reverence and a respect for the Lord, that is my middle section right here, that's my B. Where some people have not had parents that have taught them, they have had no um, teaching perhaps in the book of Proverbs at all, but yet they have become a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus said, for God so loved the world, he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Indeed, in a New Testament sense, they are believers, they have a fear, they have a reverence of the Lord. Let's say they've been growing in the, in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. And like Patrick says, sometimes people have not had an opportunity to get into Proverbs. But here, as you look at my middle section with B, you ask yourself the question now again, do I have the fear of the Lord? And if a person can say, well, yes, I do, but I can't look over to the left-hand side and, and, and claim that my parents have taught me anything, that's fine. Let's just go right up the middle section and you answer yourself, yes. And it goes right up to the top there that you advance to the beginning stage of knowledge because the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. And if a person does not have had, has not had the advantage of parental teaching along those lines, but yet they've been learning little by little, going to church, learning from other people, they at least are in that wheelhouse, so to speak, I, I believe, of the fear of the Lord. And then the third category, you know, as we go up the middle from, you know, where we have the ask our question in the B section, do you have the fear of the Lord or the respect or reverence of the Lord? And you see how it now goes to the right-hand side where, where you ask, you say the word no again. Okay, do I have the reverence of the Lord? Well, nobody's really taught me anything. Nobody's really taught me from a parental point of view. So as you're looking at your, your C box right there, um, coming out of the B box. You see where the B box is and that no comes out of the B box and goes to the right hand side? Where you ask yourself the question, do I have the fear of the Lord? And you go, well, no. And you look at the red box over on the right hand middle part of the page and you've got the six ifs right under the, right under the, the letter C. The six ifs. Now look at your Proverbs right there. Turn to Proverbs chapter 2. And we've gone over this before, but I just want to kind of say some things here that relate to the fear of the Lord and then this next sheet that I have I'm going to pull a few things together that go beyond chapters 1 through 9 but sort of pull a few lessons that we can we, we can take home for as far as some of this attitude that I'm talking about whether it be the fear of the Lord or having this attitude that if we're going to glory in anything we're going to glory in what what God has done and who he is but if you look in the C section right here that relates to chapter 2 and you look at chapter 2 verse 1 my son, if you receive my words, Solomon talking to his son, my son, if you receive my words and treasure my commands within you, and I call it the six F's, ifs and the three thens, my son, if you receive my words and treasure, and if you treasure my commands within you, and that's Solomon's words, if, you re, if he says, if you receive my words, a human man, Solomon, saying, I've got all these Proverbs, whether you hear them orally or on their piece of paper or whatever the case might be, this is the part that impresses me about chapter 2. <coughs> my son, if you receive, my son, Solomon speaking, if you receive my human words and treasure, <coughs> and treasure my commands within you, and here's the part where it gets interesting, so that 
you incline your ear to wisdom and apply your heart to understanding. You're listening to human words, but yet you have an ear that is bent toward understanding of the kind that goes beyond the human words, an understanding of this God who exercises, for example, righteousness, judgment, and loving kindness on the earth. You're listening, and in the context just prior to that, remember Lady Wisdom? Lady Wisdom, if you look at 1 verse 20, what does Lady Wisdom? Wisdom calls aloud outside, just as in chapter 1, verse 10. What does it say? My son, if sinners entice you, do not consent. If they say in verse 111, come with us, let us lie and wait to shed blood. Let us lurk secretly for the innocent without cause. And you go down that whole list of things, and these sinners, Father Solomon is giving an example of the worst extreme kind. This is not even, this is not even Johnny, don't go down the street and, and, and play with Billy because you know, Billy will break your toys. I'm not speaking of the other Billy I was talking. I always use Billy for some reason. <laughs> Billy and Johnny, sorry about that. Anyways, you know, the little boy down the street's going to break your toys, so don't go down there. This chapter 1, verses 10 through um, 19 is of the most extreme. You talk about extreme sports. This is extreme sinfulness. Solomon is saying, my son of sinners entice you, do not consent. He could have stopped right there. But he says, if they say, come with us, let us lie in wait to shed blood. Lie in wait to shed blood, that's more than a broken toy. Let us lurk secretly for the innocent without cause. Let us swallow them alive like Sheol and whole like those who go down to the pit. We shall find all kinds of precious possessions. We shall fill our houses with spoil by killing these people. Cast in your lot among us, let us all have one purse. Solomon cuts that thing right, and he says, My son, do not walk in the way with them. Keep your foot from their path, for their feet run to evil, and they make haste to shed blood. And then his final statement, he says, about a bird. You lay a net in front of a bird, and the bird's not going to walk into a net if he just laid it down there. But if you were sneaky about it and cover it with a bunch of branches and stuff and you had a snare of a tree that was a tree that was bent over with a string on it or whatever that was camouflaged it says it says right there surely in vain the net is spread in the sight of any bird but they lie in wait for their own blood they lurk secretly for their own lives and then his big conclusion so are the ways of everyone who is greedy for gain it takes away the life of its owners Solomon goes with the most extreme example if this gets to this point where let's say he's talking to his royal sons who perhaps will be in a role of leadership someday that they could be enticed by other leaders someplace else to do the unthinkable and that is to take things not just by stealing it in the middle of the night by actually solicit being solicited to do something with bloodshed and going after the innocent to get these things. So just as Solomon says, my son of sinners entice you, do not consent, leave it right there. My son of sinners entice you, do not consent. And then Lady Wisdom comes in and says, Wisdom calls aloud outside. She raises her voice in the open squares. She cries out in the chief concourses at the openings of the gates in the city. She speaks her words. And what does she say? She says something also, but she doesn't say, come and lie in wait to kill people. She says something very benign, something very nothing. She says, turn at my rebuke. Look at that word, like 23, 123. Turn at my rebuke. Turn at my rebuke. That doesn't sound so nice. It's like, oh, I've got all these wonderful things for you. No, it says, turn at my rebuke. Surely I will pour out my spirit on you. I will make my words known to you. That's it. She does not say something along the lines of those sinners who were doing some extreme enticing, but she is sitting there saying, turn at my rebuke. Surely I will pour out my spirit on you. I will make my words known to you. Now, what kind of brochure is that? If you want to talk about a brochure. Very dull and very boring. It's like, well, this doesn't seem so good. But when you flip it around and see what she says after that, because here, once again, in this section, she is going to talk about Lady Wisdom is not a person. 
It's a concept. It's an idea. But we call her Lady Wisdom personified. Like if I say, oh, look at that tree right there. It's walking down the street. Like if I was at the flood down in Irma or, you know, <laughs> Hurricane Harvey, and I saw a tree look like it was walking down the street because it was floating in the river or something, I might act like I was talking about a tree in a personified way, like it's a person. But here, look at what she says after this. And I'm going to go back to chapter 2 in a second there. In verse 24, after her very benign, nothing, when she says, turn at my rebuke, surely I'll pour out my spirit on and make my words known to you. She says, because I have called and you refused, I have stretched out my hand and no one regarded. Because you disdained all my counsel and would have none of my rebuke, here it comes, Hurricane Irma, Hurricane Harvey, throw in Andrew and throw in Hurricane Rita and every kind of alphabet you can imagine, because they go by A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Throw in every hurricane you can imagine, and this is what Lady Wisdom says she will pour down upon the person who does not listen to her rebuke. So all of a sudden she says, turn to my rebuke, surely I will pour up my spirit on you, I will make my words known to you. It's like, oh, ho, oh, oh, that doesn't sound but let's look at the flip side. Because I have called in verse 24, and you refused, I have stretched out my hand and no one regarded. Picture this person who's just giving up and giving a speech and she's at the city gates crying out to everybody who walks by and she's looking around and everybody's just walking by and nobody's paying attention. Because you disdained all my counsel and would have none of my rebuke, I also, verse 20, will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your terror comes, when your terror comes like a storm and your destruction comes like a whirlwind, when distress and anguish come upon you. When you find yourself rejecting wisdom, rejecting in the context of this Proverbs 1, the fear of the Lord, you're going to find yourself in a whole world of hurt with your own personal hurricanes where you are going to do something at that point and say, Oh, Lord, help me, or I need my wisdom now. Turn up my rebuke. Oh, I'll turn with you now. Oh, I get it, I get it. She's, now listen what she says. I will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your terror comes. When your terror comes like a storm, verse 27, and your destruction comes like a whirlwind, when distress and anguish come upon you. Oh, here it comes. Then they will call on me, verse 26. 28, my eyes are fuzzy here. Then they will call on me but I will not answer. They will seek me diligently, but they will not find me. And here is the key right here that ties in what we had said in door number B, do you have the fear of the Lord? What does she say right here in verse 29? Because they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. They would have none of my counsel and despised my every rebuke. Oh, and then here comes more of that storm. Therefore, they shall eat the fruit of their own way and be filled to the full with their own fancies for the turning away of the simple and the simple in the context of Proverbs is a person who is naive. She is crying out, if you look at back in the beginning, in verse 22, 122, how long, you simple ones, will you love simplicity? Or as it says in the context, in the, in the column here, it says, how long, you naive ones, will you love naivety? Ignorance is bliss. Most of the world loves to have a certain amount of ignorance because they don't have to be responsible for a whole lot of anything. Lady Wisdom is crying out and saying, Solomon is crying out and saying, the parents who are to be sharing some of these things with their children in the context of Old Testament Israel are in a sense crying out saying, listen to Lady Wisdom, listen to the idea of the parents teaching the fear of the Lord, listen to Lady Wisdom, you don't want to find yourself in her whirlwind, you don't want to find yourself with her calamity coming upon you where you have the unthinkable happen, it's like a kid. When a kid says, blah, 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 I'm not going to do this, I'm not going to do that. And then the parents are arguing back and forth with the kid. And then finally the parents say, fine, do what you like. I don't care anymore. Or like the teacher at the school where I work at. 
She is one of the nicest teachers, most respectable teachers I have ever met. And she's a tough cookie, to use that expression. And she will not let the kids get away with anything, but yet she is so good at what she does, the kids enjoy being in her class because she doesn't you know, just let the kids run roughshod over her. But this particular class that she has, they've been running roughshod over ever since the beginning of school about three weeks ago. And she kept warning them and warning them that if this goes too far, there's going to be consequences. There's going to be consequences. Pretty soon, she says, everybody pay attention. I'm making an executive decision. And the kids all perked up like this because they were talking and yakking and weren't concentrating on the project that they were working on. So I've made an executive decision. You guys are working on your projects with all your friends? Three, three, three people here, three people there? He says, no more. That's it. You're not going to be, you're going to be working all by yourself. No, no more projects together. So, like, oh, well, you know, it's going to give us a chance. Nope, that's it. She just loves the Lord. Like Lady Wisdom says, there's come a time you choose not to fear the Lord. And to be fair, to be you know, a person might say, we had in our Proverbs class where somebody says, well, there's a, there's a verse later on in Proverbs that says, it says, a man who hardens his neck, you know, the old expression, like, you harden his neck, like, ah, I'm not going to do that, forget you, you know, I think that's the expression, they harden their neck. A man who hardens his neck after much reproof will suddenly be broken. And this is what Lady Wisdom is saying. There comes a point for a person who much to be gleaned from there, but in all fairness, I need to say, we took away the book of Proverbs and looked at it again. We, in the New Testament sense, we have been given all things pertaining to life and godliness, like it says, I believe, in the book. And the scripture says, all scripture is God-breathed and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be adequately prepared, equipped for every good work. Second Peter, it says, God has given us his precious and magnificent promises that we might become partakers of his divine nature, having escaped the corruption that's in the world by lust. And if Proverbs is not there, don't get me wrong, that if all of a sudden we don't traffic in Proverbs, that our whole Christian life is down the drain. I don't want to get that across is what I'm trying to say. But I'm saying is that if you have the book of Proverbs in the context of this invitation to receive, to perceive, to understand. There's something about the book of Proverbs that can give you uh, it's kind of like a car. Sometimes the car that you have, you step on the gas, and there's just sort of like, mm, you, you, you think you're it doesn't. Well then, the car that I purchased, it's a, it's a Mercury safe. It looks like an old man's car. Anyways, I was told by the person who sold it to me, now this has got a kick to it. You just stomp down on that thing, it's got a special turbo thing in there, that a special, a special engine or something like that. Stomp down on that thing and you just bought it. When I'm going slow into the back, down that thing, it just pulled me into the back seat. Not quite dying, I haven't tried to pull me out of the back seat. That's just an expression. Mm. But the idea is, I believe the book of Proverbs is like a turbo get into this, find out some things about the fear of the Lord. Be able to get some things that not only get us into the wisdom and knowledge and understanding of God, but also give us some insights into things that we have never even considered before. One of those things, I started to go there. And the third part in the section C now, to go back from that, says the six ifs, my son, if you receive my or Solomon's words and treasure my commands within your soul, and like I said before, so that you incline your ear to wisdom. And, and the reason I, I backtrack on that to get you into the whole concept of the wisdom, lady wisdom, to remind you of that. So that you take Solomon's words, if you receive my Solomon's words and treasure my Solomon's commands within you, as we go into chapter 10, verse 1 and beyond, all those verses that relate to Solomon so that you incline your ear to wisdom, as we just talked about, and apply your heart to understanding. 
Yes, and here's another if. If you cry out for discernment, Solomon is saying to his sons, or by application to anyone in Israel, and by application further to any of us sitting here today, if you cry out for discernment and lift up your voice for understanding, oh God, I'm just not so smart at all. And like that one guy that I said that was walking in the street, that he says, I like to apply myself. That man says in the beginning of chapter 30 of Proverbs, he says, I'm just going to read it because I don't want to even miss a second of it here. It says, the words of Agur, the son of Rebekah, whose name was Agur, the son of Jacka, he says to his friends, Ithiel and Ukel. This is what he says, surely in 30 verse 2, I am more stupid than any man and do not have the understanding of a man. I neither learn wisdom nor have knowledge of the Holy One. And then later on in verse 5 he says, Every word of God is pure. He is a shield to those who put their trust in him. Do not add to his word lest he rebuke you and you be found a liar. And then here is that famous statement I just said, Two things I request of you. Deprive me not before I die. Remove falsehood and lies from me, far from me. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food allotted to me, lest I be full and deny you and say, Who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and profane the name of my God. So here Solomon says, back in chapter 2, If you receive my words, if, 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 if. And look at chapter 2 again. I love this. We've got six ifs followed by three then. In Proverbs chapter 2, If you seek her as silver and search for her as for hidden treasures, all these things that Solomon is talking about in wisdom, look in verse 5. If you look at the three right there, three thens. My son, if you receive my Solomon's words, treasure, incline your ear to wisdom, apply your heart to understanding, two verses one to four, then you go upward beyond the sea, up above the sea, then you will understand the fear of the Lord, number one, then, which is in verse five, then you will find the knowledge of God, which is also in verse five B. And the third then goes all the way down to verse 9. It says, Then you will understand righteousness and justice, equity and every good path. You hear that? It's about Proverbs. My son, if you receive my saying, if, 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 then. That's what I have the category C on that. If you look at the middle, do you have the fear of the Lord? Yes, I do. You go straight up to the beginning of knowledge. And over an A right here, if you listen to your parents and, and learn the fear of the Lord, and you respond to them, oh, you've got the beginning of the fear of the Lord right there. And then C, you ask yourself, do I have the fear of the Lord? And say, no, I don't. How do I get it if I don't have it? Oh, my son. If you receive my words and treasure my commands within you, oh, that means I should listen to where it's saying if you don't have the fear of the Lord and you don't have the parents who are going to teach you the fear of the Lord and you don't have it right now in the spot this is a way that you can enter into the fear of the Lord by some of that kind of Brett so when you say um, on your own in this diagram do you mean like on your own with the help of a Bible if you don't have the fear of the Lord you can gain it with the help yes, of the yes that's probably a poor choice of words but on your own initiative where, with the help of the book of Proverbs in, in specific in the context we're talking, or a Bible for as far as a New Testament context. Yeah. So on the Lord with the help of the Lord, with the Spirit of God working, but it's, it's something that's not going to come from your parents. It's not something that's within you, but it's something that you are going to seek her as silver. You're going to take some initiative. You're going to cry out for discernment. That's in the sense of how I mean All it. All of us need like some help. We need someone to be like, hey, here's a Bible and you should really look at this or some kind of nudging to get exposed to and some people are going to be
right? So sometimes the person at least is, you know, like um, in the scripture in Acts chapter 10. He himself, he was the Lord, he was well respected among the Judeans, he was calm. He can't believe that he had not yet come to him. Yet he had a certain amount of success in the Lord, even though he wasn't yet a believer. So the interesting thing, even back, I, I said a few weeks back, that I think even one of the one of the kings that I think Abraham associated with, when you know he said that his sister, his his, his wife was his sister. You remember I brought that out that his wife was his sister, and 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 the king took his wife into his harem or something sort of like like that. And then God says, "No, you can't touch this this lady. This lady's married." And then Abraham says, "Well, I." He says, "You, this, you said this was your sister." Well, it's actually. Well, God told me last night that this was your wife. I am not allowed to touch her. And then Abraham says, "I didn't." Was in this place. Crossing over the time. Christ for eternal life in our context. Yes, indeed. Um, so then, let me just finish my chart here. It says, then you will understand the fear of the Lord. You see that arrow right above the Coming back down to B again. The arrow's not real clear. It didn't show us. But it says, all of a sudden, then you will understand the fear of the Lord. So the question is, okay, do I have to do this? 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 Not, not go to jail. But there's another one that says, it's, what does it say? It says to go. Here it's like, idea that advance the but the main thing here, and see, then you will understand the fear of the Lord. Then you will find the honor of God. And here is the, the thing that I talked about in the very beginning of my introduction. Then you will find the honor of God. To know about, it in Proverbs chapter um, And the knowledge of the Holy Spirit. The fear of the Lord is popping up in this context. If you choose the fear of the Lord, the Old Testament context, or in here in the sense that you discern the fear of the Lord, look at verse 9 in chapter 2. It's really one of the greatest incentives. And once again, I'm just trying to, as a group here, incentivize us. Whether you come to the Proverbs class, the second hour, or not, everybody the next day, and whatever the case, I'm not I'm just trying to, once again, refresh our memory. The invitation here that is so good, verse 2, verse 9, it says, the third if, as you look in box C here, then Righteousness and justice, equity and every possibly make beyond the scripture we teach and we talk among ourselves and we read. But there's something supercharged in the book of Proverbs, so to speak, that has enough practical examples as we get from 10.1 and beyond that should incentivize us for looking into this book in a serious way. But how serious? If we do not have the fear of the Lord, and in the case of Bible, can teach that. Whether it's the scriptures, you know, setting that example in home, talking to the New Testament, talking about the Old Testament story, to teach the fear and reverence of the Lord by example. And the second thing is, of course, to you know, be a biblical uh, you know, church where you can hear the word of God. But then you can also be doing this justice, equity, and that. There is something here for everyone, but as long as it's done,
Proverbs 9, the beginning of wisdom. Use the idea. In the upper right hand corner, in the yellow right there, in the upper right, view from the way of evil. And look at verse uh, 2, verse 10. And uh, this is an amazing verse to me. It, 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 Chapter 2, verse 10, it says, the wisdom of the heart, you listen to her when wisdom enters your knowledge is present to your soul, whether it be the knowledge wisdom enters your heart, knowledge is present to your soul, what will happen in verse 11? Discretion will preserve you, understanding will preserve you. Taken a truck out, you know, like three times over three weeks, and each time I got broken, the truck, the truck it got broken. And, uh, one time the battery got broken. Something happened to the battery. Another time I stepped on the truck, and the truck got broken. I dropped it on the ground, and you know, uh, and it was a. Over the road, and truck bus told me, he don't. He said, take the bus, take the truck down and get it fixed. So I took the truck down and got it fixed. And before it was fixed, my new boss called me and said, What are you doing? And he said, I forget. Al told me to do it. So then he says, get that truck on the road and get back here right now. I said, well, I can't really get the truck on the road. I says, the, the taillight's out such that when I come back on Highway 8 late at night, I'm going to run into trouble. Get the truck back in here. Well, then I got the truck back in there. And the hollering at me. And I thought of the He says, stir up anger. But a soft answer turns away wrath. Right. He was speaking in such a way that if I wasn't having a calm, cool, collected, trusting in the Lord, Lord sense about me, I could have had him stir up the anger against me, and I could have. Well, then he marched me up the stairs. He says, "You come with." He, he thought, you know. But these proverbs, try them on. Look at them. Try them. You may only learn one a week, but try them on and think about the situation on a daily basis. And like it's wisdom enters your heart, knowledge is pleasant to your soul. There can be a point where it becomes to be so you look like a pair of shoes that pulls in and his ass and wife says, pull those in. An old shoe. Oh, wonderful. That's a great way to have When wisdom enters your heart and what does it say? When wisdom enters your heart and knowledge is pleasant to your soul, when you get to that point, and God is a patient, kind God who exercises righteousness and judgment and loving kindness on the earth. And our great God, who is a God of loving kindness, which is the Hebrew word kesed, which means loyal, stable love. It doesn't fluctuate at all. Great God, kindness, love us with an everlasting arm. He loves us with an everlasting love. We have by the tail, so to speak. We have a God who loves us. He cares for us. And when we look at this, 
When wisdom enters our heart and knowledge is pleasant to our soul, discretion will preserve you, understanding will keep you. And then two subsets underneath there. 16, to deliver you from the immoral woman. For what purpose? To deliver you from the way of evil. To deliver you from the immoral woman. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and mind. What was the other one? Love your neighbor as your Life gets down to loving God and loving man. That's it. And life gets it delivers you from Solomon's thinking, it delivers you from the emotional and to deliver you from the way of evil is basically what you have to basically saying that the book of the Bible is to keep you that look in verse two twenty for what reason? Deliver you from the way of evil, Proverbs 12. Deliver you from the seductress, 2 16. So you may walk in the way of good. Everything we talk about, we have the fear of the Lord. We have the reverence of the Lord. You are one who has knowledge of the things you are going to do. The word of truths. And as time goes on, it becomes so. Now, in regular practice, a number of things in your life were able to just uh, when you associate that problem with a certain situation, it's like a tool for the toolbox to be bringing out the kind of situation. Yeah. So the thing said, the last part of the little box says, so you may receive the blessings that the Lord offers throughout this book, including, as I said earlier, the knowledge of the Holy One. So this is for your own benefit here. I'm just going to do one more verse and finish up right here. Proverbs 4, verse 20. Section Think about a person's heart and attitude. Four verse twenty. My son, give attention to my words. Find your ear to my sayings. Solomon speaking to his sons again by application to us down the road. Do not let them depart from your eyes. Keep them in the midst of your heart, for they, these proverbs, these truths, are life to those who find them, and health to all their flesh. For out of it the heart spring the issues of life. Put away from you with a deceitful mouth and put perverse, perverse lips far from you. Let your eyes look straight ahead and your eyelids look right before you. Ponder the path. Don't just run down the path not looking at things. Ponder the path of your feet and let all your ways to be established. Do not turn to the path to the rest and leave your feet. It says in Proverbs chapter 3, it says, Fear the Lord. So in conclusion, this whole thing, things like Solomon pondered and sought out and set in order many problems. The preacher sought to find acceptable words and what was written was up at this page one to the preacher sought to find acceptable words and what was written up like word and truth. And listen what these proverbs are. The words are like the words of the wise, these proverbs of the wise are like goads. You're trying to put 
words of the wise are like gold, and the words of scholars are like well-driven nails given by one shepherd. Verse 13, he says, here, and further, my son, be admonished by these of making many books, there is no end, and study, much studying is wearying to the flesh. We can go to Barnes and Noble, we can go to Amazon, we can read to our brain falls out of Let's hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is man's all. And I've added some verses in here, and you go through on your own. You all have to do is work hard to most of them. You can find your ears to wisdom, apply your heart to understanding. Verse 3, you know, do not forget my law, but it's hard to keep my commandments. Verse 4, 23, which I just mentioned. And, uh, you know, the whole idea that, you know, life in ways that, like even as a uh, one of the things that says by wisdom, and I believe it's referring to the Lord Jesus Christ, even though it's not named, the Lord by wisdom founded the earth, by understanding he established the world, and the broken up of the world, the Lord Jesus Christ, by wisdom and understanding and knowledge, created and if he did that by wisdom and understanding and knowledge, oh, Heavenly Father, help us by the same kind of wisdom and understanding and knowledge to be able to handle every detail of our life in ways of relationship with man, with God, with you and our reverence and appreciation for you, to be well-pleasing to you, to you like with man so we can love them impacting those in, as our pastor phrase says, 